So who is Dr. Linda Hazard? <laughs> you know, she was actually kind of a quack that really, really believed in herself. Um, one thing about her is <clears throat> that no matter how crazy it sounds, she actually did help a lot of people. And um, usually the ones that she would starve to death would be the very wealthy ones who actually signed over a lot of their property. And not only did they sign over a lot of their property and money, um, I mean, a lot of them, not, not just money, but a whole bunch of different things. And um, it's just really fascinating how many people believed her. She was one of these people that was so strong and so forceful, and they even think that she was a little mesmerizing, that she could bend a person to her will. Um, but she was actually born, I think, in 1867, and she was born in, was it Minnesota or Wyoming? I can't remember. No, it was Minnesota. And um, she didn't really have a lot of opportunity there, so she thought, I'm just going to come over to Olala, Washington. But she actually met her husband, Sam, in Minnesota. And Sam was married at the time. So she was... A doctor taking care of his someone in his family and when she started taking care of this person that's when they started their little bit of a, a love affair well so he decided he was going to marry dr. Hazard also her name wasn't Hazard then it was Burfield or something like that isn't it Burfield but he decided he was going to marry her so this is the first part of <clears throat> her trying to convince people that she was correct and everybody else was wrong. Now I he, should point out too that this is a time too when there weren't that very many female doctors. Yes. So you know she was ahead deal. of her time. She so. was way ahead of her time. She was very forceful. She knew what she wanted. She was not a doctor. She did not get her degree. She was a, yes, she was not a real doctor. She called herself Dr. Hazard because of her treatments and her clinic and everything like that. So she'd sound a lot more professional. But, um, she was a little bit of a sociopath. yeah, <clears throat> extremely. That's what I was telling Ross. I said she was an amazing sociopath. She thought she was the eternal victim. No matter how horrible some of the things that she did, she did not see herself as the one, the antagonist. She saw herself as the victim. So when Sam was married to this other woman and then she got married to Sam, she said that the other woman and Sam were not really married. And so when they took him to trial to be as a bigamist, she basically totally believed that this other woman, I think her name was Viva, this other woman was the one that was not really married to Sam. Oh. So it was a really big trial. They, I mean, they took it to trial. It was sensationalized. There was a lot of media coverage at that time. So that was kind of her first hint and also in the uh, justice system. And um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And basically she lost. He went to jail oh. for I think two years um, and had to pay for his bigamy. But <clears throat> then he wrote all these letters saying that he was actually going to go back to his first wife. And Viva wanted him back because she thought Sam was the victim of Linda Hazard's, or Linda Bur Burfield's, was it Burfield? Yeah. Okay, I was trying to think. Her wild ways and her, you know. Enchantments. Her, yeah, her persuasion on him. So she totally did not blame Sam. She wanted him back. So he wrote her all these letters saying he was going to be back to her because actually she came into a lot of money. <laughs> so he's like, hey. Hmm? But for some reason, he left jail after she after his first wife paid for a gold filling to be put in his tooth. After that happened, he left and moved in with Dr. Hazard, his other wife. So that's kind of how it happened. And then that's when they moved out to Olala. Um, basically. But what's really interesting is her property, which they called Starvation Heights, was actually owned by one of her patients. 
so it used to be called Whispering Heights, and then it turned into Starvation Heights after, you know, her clinic and everything. But one of her patients, um, I can't think of his name, but he owned it first. Was and it then, Raider of course, like yeah, Raider, that's Raider. it. It was Raider. Um, he was a patient of hers, and sadly, he passed away. <laughs> so, but not before he signed over all of his property to Dr. Hazard. So she saw this, wow, I have all this, you know, beautiful, beautiful countryside and whispering heights. And now I'm going to make my, my world renowned sanitarium because at that time too, Dr. Kellogg, who had made his amazing sanitarium in the Colorado mountains, um, she wanted to surpass that. She wanted this to be the most grand sanitarium that anybody could ever know, especially for the wealthy to come and, you know, relax and do all their health things. But of course, with her treatment, she believed she could starve you almost to death and then slowly bring you back. And then you would be perfect. Everything from cancer to um, anxiety, to nerves, to, um, you know, asthma, every single thing you can think of, female you would be, hysteria. yeah, female hysteria was a big thing. <laughs> and she would have personal massages for the inside of a woman to help her relax a little more too, mm. which was a big thing. <laughs> I love it, the personal massages. And, um, but this regimen of hers included a little bit of tom tomato water with asparagus, and they would have that about um, two times a day. That was dinner and lunch and dinner and no breakfast. That was a big thing. No meat whatsoever. So that was their whole, you know, eating regimen. And then there were like, it started off with one to two enemas a day. And sometimes these would last two to three hours, if you can even imagine that much. But um, it is just amazing some of the things that she put these people through. And her downfall was actually Claire and Dora Williamson. And um, they basically went in because they were very wealthy. They wanted to try something new because of their health. And actually, in actuality, there was really nothing wrong with them at all. So when they came to um, the doctor, they actually checked into the Buena Vista Hotel in Seattle for a while because her sanctuary was not finished yet. So when they were in the Buena Vista Hotel for a while, that's when they first started their treatments of their, of their enemas and their, their diets, everything. So it was about 40 days, I think, without any kind of food, with just broth and so water. It was like grueling massages and stuff. They yeah, had to the go horrible through. deep tissue massages, and also with her pummeling them with her fists. And this was not a small woman. This was a big. I mean, she was very big muscly woman as like a lot of people would talk about and she would give them these massages where she would pummel them and pummel their backs and these were like little tiny starving people and they would have bruises covering them so so when they um started giving the treatments at the buena vista hotel that's when they almost like started that's when they were pretty weak and then she decided well our san my sanatorium isn't very well um it's not very finished but we're gonna go ahead and bring you guys here and you can stay in my house. So I was actually, I got to investigate the house um, before they tore it down. And um, one of the things is it's a very small house, but the upstairs, there's a staircase. And I think if some of you can see the pictures there, there is a picture of a staircase going up to this room. Mm -hmm. And Claire and Dora Williamson actually were on that um, landing. Right as soon as you get up there, there is a kind of a landing, but the rooms, there's one room here and there's the other room that's just in this other little doorway. And they were probably maybe only 10 feet, but Dr. Hazard did not allow them to see each other or talk to each other. She didn't want anybody influencing the other to leave. So she had a mega strong hold on them. Um, a lot of people, uh, with all the people that were in her care, um, some of the patients would kind of go down into the, the town, knock on people's doors, and beg for food because they were starving. And the people would be so scared of Dr. Hazard, they'd shut their door and say, we don't want any part of this. 
because Dr. Hazard basically told all the townspeople that if you interfere in my treatments, you will regret it. And they didn't know what that meant, but they didn't, weren't going to take any chances because, ah, there's a spider. Because <laughs> this is just it's just know. nature. <laughs> nature. I just love it. <laughs> but uh, so that's basically kind of what happened until Claire Williamson died of starvation. What they did was they sent a, they got a message out and they weren't letting mail go out or anything of the Starvation Heights area. They even put a lock on the mailbox to make sure that nobody sent out any unauthorized letters to family, like to rescue them or anything like that. And there were quite a few patients before them that yeah. tried to escape. Yes, and there were out. a couple of people. When um, Claire Williamson passed away and they got message out to their old nanny that was actually in Australia. So it took her a while to get back into this part of the country. So it took her, I think it was like a, at least a few, a couple of weeks or a few weeks. But anyway, she took the yeah, steamer up to... Yeah, they were from to, Canada. Yeah. They came and, to, they were, what I remember, they were vacationing in Seattle, or no, Vancouver. They yeah, were they were going to live Vancouver at the, in Vancouver, the famous hotel. The Empress. The yeah. Empress. They were on vacation at the Empress when they came across a flyer that talked about her, yes. um, her special treatment. Her special treatment. Sale in the lobby of the hotel. Oh, yes, yeah. that's right, that's right. And they yeah. thought, this was, sounds like a wonderful thing for, you know, especially for um, Claire's. She had a, what was it, a upturned uterus. Hmm. I don't know what that means, but sounds like she thought the starvation diet would help her with her uterus. <laughs> I turn know. it around? <laughs> yeah, turn, I have no idea. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like I said, they always thought that their... Um, they had these horrible ailments, but of course they were very wealthy and just wanted to do the latest fad and, you know, all their health, their health care. But uh, they got word to their old nanny, Margaret, and Margaret rushed as soon as she could because she was really worried about the tone of the letter. And sadly, when she did finally get to Olala, um, found out that Claire did die. So Dora was a mere, I think, 62 pounds or something like that when she got here, and Dora had signed over all her legal rights to Dr. Hazard. So Dr. Hazard was not going to let her leave Olala at all. She wanted to take care of her for the rest of her life. And they were extremely wealthy. And so all this money, everything else, they thought, you know, what a great deal. So <clears throat> they also had an uncle that moved to, that was living in Portland, Oregon. So um, the Margaret got a secret message out to him and said, you've got to come back here, you know, we, I can't do anything, I can't get them out. But another thing is that even though Claire had died about a week or two before, they still had her body at Butterworth and Sons. And when they saw her body, they didn't recognize it as Claire. <clears throat> she was not emaciated. She did not have any emaciated, she lost a lot of weight. She was not, you know, really skinny and her hair color was different but they insisted with the death process this was what she looked like so it was really fascinating because um, later on you know people thought okay did Butterworth were Butterworth and Sons actually handled most of the cremations and a lot of other things and also prepared bodies for um, their relatives to look at, but they didn't want their relatives to see how emaciated these people are. So did Butterworth and Sons, yeah, not Butterworth and Sons, yeah, it was Butterworth and Sons, did they find these bodies to substitute for the, you know, skeletal bodies? <clears throat> or was that Dr. Hazard that found the bodies to give to them? So the Butter that Butterworth... That was a whole separate yeah. trial. They weren't sure who was yeah. actually involved in switching the bodies for, for display. So. Exactly. So yeah, it was one of those things where they just didn't know. So, but Butterworth and Sons were never charged. So, you know, but it was very interesting and they could never prove that it was a different body because nobody, you know, had come forward. But. They didn't have DNA at that point. No, did not have DNA. So basically Dora and her nursemaid Margaret finally got to escape, but the uncle had to pay Sam and Linda Hazard over $2,000 in fees, and that was 1911 back then. Yeah. 
<laughs> if you know, you know, it's probably, I don't know, 30,000, who knows what it is today. It's probably got to be close to a couple hundred thousand. Yeah, we could think so, because, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly, to buy a house for almost a thousand. Houses in the Lala area went for about 500 in those days. Damn. So, wow. yeah, <clears throat> so, yeah, that would be quite a, quite a bit of money. And, um, so, after they paid the ransom, I guess, basically, what they called it, the fees, they were allowed to leave, but... When they left, they started thinking about things and said, you know, Claire's murder, it was a murder. You know, they started thinking about it, but it really was a murder. So that's when Dora got in touch with the British Council and um, started telling him the plight and everything. And he was kind of incensed that these were British subjects who came to the United States, that filthy, you know, country that, uh, you know, the, the heathen country. And... Um, so that's kind of how it started. They got the British Council, and then they got a really good lawyer who they didn't think was that good of a lawyer. His name was R. Kelly. R. Kelly. His name was Kelly. <laughs> it wasn't R. Kelly. <laughs> that would be a whole other trial. <laughs> but uh, but so that's kind of how it was, and they didn't really think that he was going to be that good of an attorney. So so that's kind of the story in a nutshell. And then she was found guilty and sentenced to two years in prison. Which prison was it? Walla Walla. She Walla was sent Walla, to Walla yeah. Walla prison. And um, after that, that's when her sanitarium burnt down um, there. So they decided, you know, she wasn't supposed to start her practice again. Well, she was banned after yeah. she was released. And I think she got out for early for, uh, for good behavior. I think she got out early. She didn't actually have to serve the two years. That's why I think she got that. She got out, but she was banned. Yeah, but she was banned from uh, practicing in, in America. So she decided to, that's when she moved to New Zealand and started a practice there, continuing to do the same thing, starving people to death. How, was, how long was she there? About 10 years? I think so? it was around 10 years, 10 years. Yeah, something like that. She and then here in the early 30s and everything, she actually got the, the large place. The large place. Yeah. That's pretty good. So that's kind of basically it. When she got here, um, she started feeling sick, and then that's when she kind of decided that she was going to show the world that her treatment was the best treatment. So she started to follow her <laughs> starvation diet, and she died. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, part of me thinks it's, you know. Where really is she good. buried? Does anybody know? Or I was going to look that up, and I didn't look it up. But uh, her son, I think his name was Rolla. Rollin. Rollin, Rollin, that's right. Her the son. called actor. Yeah, he was an actor. <laughs> and uh, he was supposed to try, he was going to ride the um, sensationalized trial of his mother so that he could get better parts in Seattle. So so I don't know whatever happened to his acting career or anything like that, but uh, it was very interesting. I have to look that up too and see if we can find some pictures of him, but... Uh, but there are just some pictures of, of them, and there's a picture of Dora in there. If you can see the, um, her, it looks like half starving. This was a picture of all three of them, Dora, um, Claire, and Margaret, right before the whole experience happened. We have different news people. There's actually, I think it's in, it's in a bundle. I didn't, uh, Oh, you didn't say both together? Yeah, I didn't say both together. But the pictures here are the pictures of the house, and they supposedly had torn it down. Um, it's yeah, I was gonna say it's just it's just that like way. right yeah right <laughs> it's like right up there. It's not too far at all. This gulch that runs behind the cemetery is the gulch that she threw garbage into. Ah, garbage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was a crematorium on the property. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that, a good way to get rid of the bodies right away. <laughs> well, you know, they, they she was, was she convicted of, see, they think that she killed, they absolutely think she killed 20, but there are 40 that were missing or something like that that they could never prove. victims believe the one that's on here, Eugene Wakeland, uh, was actually murdered with his own gun. Ah. There, oh, yeah, there was, that's there right. Was a the guy. Who died just a few years ago who actually did. There was a witness who died just a few years ago who actually saw um, uh, 
her pick him <laughs> off from her front porch while he was walking to the outhouse. Uh, interesting. Yeah. She's oh, got that's a good shot. And then she walked over and uh, wiped the gun off and put it in her pants and then called the police. <laughs> wow. I could see that. You know, with everything that I've read about her, even the newspaper articles, you know, I tried not to just read Starvation Heights, you know. I tried to read a lot of the newspaper articles, too, and it's just really fascinating how much of a hold she has and what a strong woman she had. During the trial, there were a lot of women who were basically protesting the, of her unfair treatment because she was a woman and a doctor. Uh, it was a big thing. They really thought that she was unjustly accused. So, you know, it's very, very, you know, it's like reading um, Starvation Heights by Greg Olson was, I mean, you know, I know he took some liberties because it was a book and everything and everything, but there is a lot of uh, the newspaper articles, too, and talk about the way she talked and everything. But, yeah, I believe she was a major sociopath. I think that she, um, like I said, she always thought she was the victim. Um, you can kind of see that quite a ways. Sorry, some of them are probably hard to read when I blew them up. 